Good morning and uh, welcome to All Saints, to a double commemoration today uh, for two local men, Charles Couchman and Alfred Langford. Um, sadly, it's not the first and won't be the last uh, commemoration where two or even sometimes three men died on the same day. Um, Charles Couchman uh, was born in St Giles, London in March of 1882. He was the son um, of uh, another Charles Couchman, um, a veteran of the army, 25 years with the cavalry, um, fought in the Crimean War and served through the uh, Indian Mutiny. Um, he retired uh, and became a foreman housekeeper, perhaps working for a man who used to be one of his, uh, one of his officers. He lived in St Giles, uh, London. Uh, he and his wife, um, Eleanor, were both from Kent. Um, Charles was from Goudhurst in Kent, a village which keeps coming up in our commemorations. Many of our men seem to have a, a connection with Goudhurst. And Ellen uh, was from nearby Cranbrook. Uh, they came to London to, work at, uh, to live and work at St Giles, first in Castle Street, uh, and then at nearby Neal Street. Charles was born uh, at, when the family were living at Castle Street, one of several children uh, they had. Um, Charles's father was, was significantly older than, than his mother. Uh, and unfortunately, he died when Charles was very young, about 11 or 12 years old. Um, Ellen remarried. She married um, a chap called Frederick Davis, who had been living in Middlesex but had come to Banstead um, to work at the asylum as a night attendant. And they married here uh, at All Saints in 1894, uh, and they set up home together uh, in Park Cottage in Park Road. It's one of the oldest buildings in Banstead. It's at least 18th century, and I was talking to the lady that lived there, and she said that she's been told that parts of the core of the house might date back to the 15th century. It's one of a cluster of three grade two listed cottages um, down Park Road. Um, and they lived there uh, and went on to have a couple of sons of their own, Frederick, who we commemorated uh, two years ago, unfortunately, uh, and Leonard. Um, the Couchman children came with Ellen, uh, and they finished their education at our local village school. We know that one of them, one of the girls, um, uh, took part in nursing and cooking competitions uh, against the other village girls. And Charles probably finished the last two or three years of his schooling at the village school. He lived next door, actually, to the schoolmaster, Henry Nibs, who lived in Jira Cottage, um, which is uh, uh, right next door to, to Park Cottage. After completing his schooling, uh, Charles joined the army. He was only 14 years old. He was 4 foot 11 high, weighing just over 5 stones. He had a lot of growing to do. Um, but he enlisted as a drummer boy um, with the Royal Inner-Skinning Fusiliers. Now, he would be uh, apprenticed as a drummer uh, for two or three years, so he wouldn't go into, into a combat role um, immediately. But he would be taught to play the drum, uh, the bugle and the fife in order to issue orders and uh, chart the daily barrack routine uh, and keep the men in time um, as they marched. Now, within about two months of joining the army, he'd already got his third-class certificate of education, uh, which was equivalent to something like the standard six that we had in our schools at the time, something around about a 12-year-old standard level of education. And very shortly afterwards, he got his second-class uh, certificate of education. They were very important because he was looking for, he'd signed on for 12 years, um, and so he was looking for a, a long career in the army, and those certificates would allow him to be promoted um, as high as sergeant. After completing his apprenticeship um, as a drummer, um, he, uh, as a drummer boy, he became a fully-fledged uh, drummer at the age of 16. And it was a, only a year later when he went to war for the first time uh, at the age of 17. He went out to South Africa uh, to fight the Second Boer War uh, with, the, uh, with the 1st Battalion of the Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers. They sailed in October um, of 1899. They were there almost at the beginning uh, of the conflict. After rounding the Cape, uh, they were sent on to Durban and there they joined uh, General Buller's Ladysmith Relief Force. Um, Buller had begun the war at, on the home front and he'd advised for months there should not be any troops left north of the Tugela River. But the general who had fought a force at Ladysmith ignored um, his warnings and was soon surrounded by the Boers and a siege, uh, a siege ensued. And so we had to go and, and relieve that, break that siege and relieve the garrison um, that were there. So Buller gathered together thousands of, thousands of men. Uh, in, the Inniskilling Fusiliers were brigaded um, with three other Irish battalions to form uh, an Irish brigade under Major General Fitzroy Hart, a man of immense personal courage and bravery, but also quite, quite mad. They, <laughs> the first major engagement, the Inniskillings fought four major engagements uh, in the advance to Ladysmith and beyond, and the first of those was at the River Colenso. It was the obvious crossing point 
uh, the village of Colenso is the obvious crossing point over the river Tugela. So both attacker and defender headed there. The Boers were in force, they were holding the, the high ground um, on the far side of the river. Uh, they were very well concealed, they'd had time to build their defences, they were mostly expert marksmen. Um, and the British army, no slouches in the marksmanship stakes themselves, uh, were on unfamiliar ground and they advanced towards Colenso. Now Buller already knew it was probably a trap, it was the obvious uh, crossing point, but there was a very, very tempting bridge through the village. He also had heard about another, another ford across the river, uh, just a few hundred yards down, and so he planned to split his infantry into two columns, one going through the village over the bridge and the other going round to find the ford and cross the river there, while mounted infantry um, uh, performed a flanking manoeuvre to get around behind um, the Boers. They started the engagement with a prolonged artillery bombardment. Now, the Boers played possum through the whole of that engagement. They didn't fire a single shot at the British, and in the end, the British were convinced that they'd given up and gone home. And so they began their advance. One column, uh, we talked about an earlier commemoration, actually, um, including some of our Surrey soldiers, uh, went to the village and the bridge. The Irish Brigade were sent left to find this drift. They were led by a native guide who either really didn't know where he was going or was possibly in the pay of the Boers because he led them the wrong way. Uh, Major General Hart um, instructed his men to move in very, very close columns as if they were marching around at, at Aldershot or on Salisbury Plain. Um, in very old fashioned, almost like he was fighting the Napoleonic Wars um, again. He would uh, be very visible, exposing himself uh, to any fire that came his way, encouraging the men by his own personal example. As men lay shattered around him by shell fire, he would tell his men, don't worry, you'll soon get used to it and then march on to, into, into even stiffer fire. The guide, there was a ford somewhere in the region of where they're going, but the guide led them away from it into a loop of the river, two sides of which um, housed con Boers concealed in Sangers, low, behind low stone walls. Um, and they were just waiting for the, the Irishmen to advance into there. Now, the commander of the Inner Skillings had already probably had a low opinion of his commander and had already instructed his men to spread out, which displeased um, Hart somewhat. The other columns of the Irishmen were not so lucky and they met quite a hot fire, suffered some very severe casualties. Also, the commander of the Inner Skillings, or maybe one of his junior officers, had spotted that although he could see no ford where they were heading, there was something that looked a bit like one, which was the ford, um, off to the left. And his men had started um, to edge their way towards it and could possibly have outflanked the Boers. But Hart ordered them back, ordered them all into the loop of the river, straight into a trap. They suffered extremely heavy casualties. There were some very, uh, very brave, um, very valorous acts on the day. Some men were even said to have managed to cross the river, never to be heard of again. And just a few hours later, uh, they had to be pulled back. Um, the uh, the Inniskillings su suffered something like 200 casualties um, in that attack, very high um, casualty rates, and they were pulled back. Um, after just a few weeks later, they were engaged once again, suffering similar number of casualties, and then a couple of weeks later suffering another set of casualties, the same number. So by now, they had lost most of their professional call and were being reinforced by uh, militia men um, from Ireland. And so when they came to fight the fourth um, and possibly most important of their engagements, um, the, final, um, the final Boer defences at Belfast and the last set piece of, of the war, um, when they were charged with taking the key um, objective, um, a cop, um, which had been pounded by British artillery to no great effect, um, and the Ennis Skillings were to, were to charge towards it and capture this, this key position, um, they were full of inexperienced, probably very scared men. The Boer troops they were facing were the Johannesburg police. They were some of the crack troops that they had. Um, only small in number, they were armed with uh, their rifles and also with a pom-pom, quick-firing artillery gun. And when that pom-pom opened up on the Ennis Skillings, the Ennis Skillings inexperienced men broke and ran away, but they were rallied. And it was probably Charles that was rallying them, probably with a bugle call. And once they had stabilised and regrouped, they charged again and they carried the position. And the entire Boer line collapsed and it marked the end of the, the, the last set piece battle, at the end of the regular war. And after that, everything devolved into a guerrilla war. Charles uh, spent, uh, had to stay in South Africa for another couple of years, but it really dragged on a long time. Um, and he was attached to various different columns scouring the countryside looking for guerrilla bands, and then spent the last few months of the war, like most British soldiers did, building uh, chains of blockhouses um, tied together with strands, uh, mile long strands of barbed wire that, that subdivided the veld into a grid through which the mounted Boer bands could no longer move. <laughs> 
Um, it, brought, it brought the uh, Boers to the, the negotiating table uh, and the war ended in 1902. But the British Army remained as an army of occupation and it would be months later um, before Charles uh, returned home. Um, he completed his five years with the colours by that point and was destined to spend uh, seven years in the reserve, as most men do. But instead he signed on um, as a permanent full-time member of, of staff at one of the provisional militia uh, battalions. And so he continued to be in full-time employment with the army. Um, it was just shortly after that that he married uh, to Mary Ann Coyle um, of Ballyshannon um, on the northwest coast um, of Ireland. And they went on to have six children together, although sadly they did lose one of their daughters um, very early in her life. <coughs> they moved around quite a bit uh, with the Ballyshannon. They lived um, in Enniskillen for a while, uh, and then after that they went to uh, Castle Derg in County Tyrone. Uh, and at that point, Charles left his full-time job with the army. He still uh, remained in the reserve, so if we did go to war, then he would be called up. But he applied his trade um, as a peddler. I don't know what he, don't know what he was selling, um, but the family were boarding um, in Castle Zerg in 1911, still living in that area three years later uh, when war broke out. The reserves weren't actually mobilised until about three months after the war began, but many, many of the reservists volunteered for service, and Charles was one of those. Uh, and he uh, re-enlisted re in the army as a full-time uh, regular in August of 1914. Now he served on the home front for quite a long time. He was, uh, uh, as, a, as a Boer War uh, NCO, he was very uh, valuable on the home front, training the inexperienced men, Kitchener's volunteers um, that the army was uh, being reformed um, with. And so he was kept on the home front uh, for another two years or so. And we know that he was still in Ireland um, on the 14th of January 1916. It's the last date that we, can, uh, that we know that he was in Ireland. Um, he was posted to um, the second battalion of the Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers uh, and joined them in France at some point after that. Now they suffered quite badly on the Somme. He may have gone out as a replacement, um, a reinforcement for those men uh, in the summer of 1916, or he may have gone out as early perhaps as May of 1916. Uh, if he did so, then he would have fought on the first day of the Somme. Um, the 32nd Division um, that the, the Inniskilling Fusiliers uh, were in were mostly um, Powell's battalions from the north of England. Um, and the Inniskillings were the only Irish battalion um, in the entire division. They'd originally been meant to serve with the uh, 36th Ulster um, Division, but they, that had been, uh, there'd been a delay and they'd ended up um, with this unit instead. They were going into battle alongside the 36th Ulster Division, mm -hmm. however, um, around the village of Teepfal. Um, high up on a ridge um, above uh, the river Ancre. Now, the Ulster Division were attacking to the north, to the left um, of Tietval, and 32nd Division, um, Charles's Division, were assaulting the village of, of, of Tietval um, directly. Um, there were very, very formidable defences there. It was a, a head-on assault. There was not no sort of finesse, no cunning to, to, to their plan. Um, strong defences, Germans protected from the, uh, the week-long artillery bombardment by um, a network of something like 200 bunkers that had been dug under the village of Tietval. Their machine gunners were ready to pop up and open fire as soon as the British began their advance. The wire in front of Tietval wasn't very well cut. And so the attack of 32nd Division um, was a failure from the very start. Um, on the left, however, the Ulster Division, whose wire had been extremely well cut, including uh, a section cut by one of our Banstead gunners that we commemorated, um, recently, um, were lying out in advance of their trenches. They had an advantage, a head start over other troops. They were carrying less kit than a lot of the men around them. And their advance was very successful. And they made it all the way to their fourth objective that day, further than anybody else anywhere near them on the battlefield that day. Charles's battalion, the Inniskilling Fusiliers, had been held back during that attack um, as a reserve. Uh, and they were sent to try and uh, join the gap between the 32nd Division and the 36th um, Ulster Division. But they met a very heavy fire uh, when they advanced and they were soon pulled back, um, holding trenches, waiting for another division to advance through them. They never arrived uh, and Thiepval held out until the end of September um, of that year. After holding trenches for a few days, they fought again in the village of Oviers, which has claimed the lives of two of our Banstead men. Uh, and they fought there on two occasions, suffered very badly uh, there and they were pulled out of the line uh, for a rest and refit. And it, it is most likely that that's when uh, Charles joined them. They're sent to a quiet area of the line, or what had become a quiet area of the line, up by Luce in northern France. Uh, and they were there for several months before they returned to the Somme battlefield. Uh, and they played a supporting role in the Battle of the Ancre, the last major engagement 
um, of the Battle of the Somme. They did then fight on with some minor operations um, after that, um, before being, uh, being pulled out um, over after Christmas to um, go and spend some time in the French sector of the line, just south of the Somme. And it was just at that moment that the Germans pulled out of their Somme position. It had become untenable. We'd bitten away small chunk after small chunk of their defences. It had taken months and it had taken um, a huge number, hundreds of thousands of casualties in order to do it. But we had weakened the Germans enough that they were prepared to retreat. And they moved back to their Hindenburg line, their new set of defences. And as they moved back, um, the British and the French advanced and the inner skillings went with them. Uh, and they reached the outskirts of um, the town of saint quentin um, on the banks of the River Somme. And they fought engagements at a nearby village there uh, called Savy, um, during, while the rest of the British army was fighting um, further north at Arras in April. Um, after that, they were um, sent up to Belgium, uh, where there were unused reserves in the Battle of Messines, the low-lying town of Ypres, where you're sitting there. Uh, we'd have Messines uh, over here with the high ground over there, uh, the ridge of, uh, ridge of high ground running over here, all the way up to the village of Passchendaele over there, and a low waterlogged plain here. Uh, the Battle of Messines, famous mine battle that took place over there when we blew um, 500 ton tons of, of high explosive under the Messines, Ridge and blew the Germans out of their frontline defences. Um, it was an enormous success and it meant that many of the reserves, like the inner skillings, weren't actually needed that day. So after that engagement was over, rather than fight with the rest of the British Army at, in the Battle of Passchendaele itself, uh, they were sent north to garrison the trenches where they ran into the sea uh, of the dunes of Newport, 20 miles north um, of Ypres. It was a very, very strange sector. They said it was the strangest sector of line they'd had to hold. It was absolutely dead flat. The whole area was very boggy. It was crisscrossed with, uh, with waterways. Um, there were very few uh, crossing points there. The British had managed to establish a bridgehead on the far side of the River Issa, which divided Newport from the towns um, around it. And early on in the war, the Belgians had opened the floodgates and they'd flooded the countryside around there to provide a barrier about 2,000 to 3,000 yards wide uh, from the Germans. So in between these great big areas of flooded land, there were short stretches of of line, very, very flat, no one had any observation um, over them. And one of those particular sectors uh, was, um, was the St George's sector, which was uh, the second sector that the Inner Skillings held when they were there. Uh, it was just an island, completely uh, surrounded by, by floodland. Um, just a, a stre little stretch of road with a few submerged houses and a trench running along it. It was, they said it was a very bizarre place to be. Um, and after serving there, um, they uh, they helped the Royal Engineers of the Tunnelling Company um, in Newport itself, digging networks of tunnels um, under, the, under the village. And it was there that they were gassed with, for the first time with mustard gas, a new weapon, which had just made its battlefield debut about 10 days um, earlier. There were something like 200 casualties uh, to the inner skillings working for the Royal Engineers. It is very likely that, that Charles was gassed at the time. Uh, the, the, the noise of the gas shells exploding were very, very quiet, and they were mingled in with the heavier, uh, the bigger reports of the of the heavy artillery shells were fired in the same barrage. It was an odorless gas. They didn't know it was there. They, they hadn't encountered it before. And symptoms would usually only show hours after exposure. So it was a, it was a hidden menace. Uh, the men, once they'd been uh, drilled to, uh, uh, to be used to this, they kept their gas masks on all the time. But when they had to cross bridges over the canals and rivers in the area, they'd have to take their gas masks off at night to see where it was they were going, otherwise they'd fall in the canal. And it was then that the Royal Engineers believed most men uh, became affected by the gas. So as I say, over 200 casualties, some of whom died, um, and others um, who were back with their unit just a few days later. As the summer wore on, um, alternating spells in the line uh, and out, the British army were fighting still at Passchendaele, but their advance had come to a halt. And the troops, um, like Charles at the coast, who were waiting for that breakthrough to the south at Ypres, had to carry on waiting. The plan at, at Passchendaele was that main infantry assault down at Passchendaele, plus an amphibious landing on the coast not far from where Charles was. And Charles' fourth army were to cross over the, ridge, the river Easter uh, and advance, um, advance towards the German defences on the coast. Now, where the sector that uh, Charles was holding uh, on the 25th of September, 100 years ago yesterday, was um, by the village of Lombard Side. And that was the very important sector of line. It was one of these flat stretches surrounded by floodland with a village in front of them um, in German hands. It was vital to the British because it was their bridgehead for this crossing um, of the river for Fourth Army. 
most of the, there are six major waterways that all congregated in that area, uh, and they were all crossed by bridges in that area. Every day the Germans would shell the bridges and destroy them, and every night the Royal Engineers would have to, to build, up, build them up um, again. It was a very, very hard time. The Germans knew the British were going to attack. The British thought the Germans were about to attack, and the British line was under constant shell fire uh, throughout their entire tour in the trenches. And it was on probably on the 25th of September that Charles lost his life in those trenches. Um, he was 35 years old. Unlike many of the men we've been commemorating, uh, we actually know where Charles is buried, and he's buried in Coxside uh, Military Cemetery, um, not very far uh, from Newport. And he left a widow and five children. The second man we're going to commemorate today, Alfred Charles Langford, uh, was born at about the time that uh, Charles was taking the second of his, uh, his school exams, actually, um, in the summer of 1898. Um, the Langfords had come to Bastard um, very shortly before. Um, Alfred's dad, Alfred, uh, was a man with life experience in all branches, uh, and he was working as a gardener um, at Gerrard's Lodge, which used to stand on the corner of Garrett's Lane and Brighton Road, where the Ford Garage is today. They had a vast garden which stretched all the way down to Shrubland Court, almost the junction of, of Shrubland Road, uh, and they employed um, Alfred as a full-time gardener there. Um, he also had other jobs in the house. He sharpened knives and, and cleaned boots um, as well until the, 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 the wealthy timber mer merchant that lived there um, employed a, a, a houseboy as well. The family lived in the stables uh, and it was there that, that our Alfred uh, was born on the 24th of August 1898. Uh, he was baptised here at All Saints about nine days, nine days later. Uh, another son followed and just as Alfred was about to start um, school in the, the high street, um, the family moved away. Um, his father had applied for a job as a head gardener where other gardeners were kept uh, and they moved away to Potter's Bar in Hertfordshire. When Alfred grew up he became a gardener like his father uh, and at the time war, was, uh, war broke out they were working together uh, at Thamesmead in Oxfordshire. Uh, now he joined, uh, he was conscripted um, when he turned 18 uh, in the summer of 1916 but men weren't taken into the army immediately that they, they reached 18. Uh, they would only start training when they were about 18 and a half. And so he joined a training reserve battalion in February of 1917, and probably trained down in, in Dorset. Um, you had to be 19 to serve overseas, uh, and most conscripts um, would be sent out to the front almost as soon as they turned 19, and that was the case um, with Alfred. He was sent to join the Royal Sussex Regiment just a few days um, after his, uh, his 19th birthday, uh, and joined the 13th um, service battalion. Um, they were a PALS battalion, very unusual to have PALS battalions in, in the south of England. They too had been decimated um, in the Battle of the Somme and they were getting reinforcements from, from wherever they could. Um, they were in the Ypres salient, they'd been in there for quite a while, they'd been there since the beginning of the battle. Uh, they were in uh, a similar area to some of the men we've commemorated recently, such as uh, George Blunt uh, or Albert Waters just the other day, in the south um, of that salient, um, around the, the small village of, of Veerstrat. And they were to take part in one of General Plumer's, um, General Plumer's steps to victory um, that had just begun uh, 100 years ago last week. The uh, Fifth Army had played themselves out. Responsibility for the attacks had been handed over to Plumer's um, Second Army, and he conceived a new plan, which was a series of limited advances focused on a narrow frontage, double the amount of men per yard of front, four times the number of guns per yard of front as had been previously um, available. The first of those attacks um, to go in uh, was on the 20th of September last week, the Battle of the Menin Road Ridge, uh, where we commemorated um, Albert Waters, who fell at Tower Hamlet Spur. Um, and the second of those was 100 years ago today, the Battle of Polygon Wood on the 26th of September. The Australians, 100 years ago last week, had done extremely well. They'd advanced over the high ground of the Gellervelt Plateau. They captured half of Polygon Wood as planned. The British, on their right, had not done quite so well. They had a very, very tricky time of it. Um, a spur of high ground ran off the south of the Gellervelt Plateau. It's called Tower Hamlet Spur. There was a small, uh, a small hamlet um, strung out along the road um, on the top of the ridge. And at the end, towards the end of that spur, was a, a formidable um, German defensive fortification called the Quadrilateral, 500 yards long, uh, 150 yards to 200 yards deep, an entirely self-contained uh, fortification. Plenty of bunkers for the men, 
to shelter from any bombardment, and plenty of machine gun emplacements uh, for when the attacks inevitably began. Uh, it was part of the third system of major uh, German defences. Last week, 100 years ago last week, we'd managed to reach the second line of German defences in that area, but we hadn't quite got ourselves up out of the Basseville Beak Valley to take this fortification of Quadrilateral. So that was the job 100 years ago today, to complete the capture of Tower Hamlet Spur. And the men of the 13th Royal Sussex um, went over the top at dawn. They reached their objective, they fought their way up to the top of that spur, just the other side of the road, through the German third line. But they were very, very weakened by it. Um, they had something like 200 out of 600 men, uh, less than that actually, 120 men out of 600 men, that were still able to fight uh, by the end of that day. The attack on their right that was aimed at the quadrilateral was slowed by boggy ground in the valley. They lost the cover of their barrage and they never really stood a chance. And Tower Hamlet's spur would hold out for months afterwards when the rest of the British army had finally reached Passchendaele. Uh, Alfred was one of the many men from the Royal Sussex Regiment um, who was killed that day. He was 19 years old. He has no memorial in Bansted and I've not been able to find any memorial anywhere in the UK to him. Charles is remembered in Banstead though. Despite moving away very young, he's remembered here on the War Memorial, in the chapel here, on the Garth Memorial, um, in the churchyard and, on, and in the memorial book um, here.